That's my version of the jingle. Can you hear me? Can you hear me in, in podcast land? Just leave me a... Uh, Tess, yes. Okay, good. All right. It's time to flip the screen around so you can see my weird-looking face. How do I do that? Swipe down, double tap to flip. There we go. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hi, how are you? This is not the microphone that you can hear, but uh, hello, hello, hello. Oh, it's nice to see you all. Um, I've got this microphone here. I've got my headphones on. Uh, hello. That's because I'm going to record an episode of Luke's English Podcast, and I decided that I would put Periscope on at the same time. Hello to Poland. Hello, Pavel. Hello, Janice T2. Hello, how are you? Nice to have you all here. Um, so I'm going to record an episode of Luke's English Podcast. This is the first time that I've done a live stream of a podcast recording. Um, I've got my computer right here. There it is. Um, so most of the time I'm going to be looking at this uh, screen while I go through some of the notes that I've prepared. Um, hello. Hello, Worlds Builder. Have you built any worlds recently? Uh, so, um, that's why I've got these headphones on. That's why I've got this microphone here. What you're getting on Periscope is um, different. Uh, it's from a different microphone. So it's not this one. All right. Uh, what you will eventually be able to do is download uh, all of this in a podcast episode. But what you're getting right now is just like extra special content before I've started recording. So this is sort of um, Periscope only extra footage. You do it every day, Worlds Builder. Excellent. Uh, um, how? <laughs> how? On Minecraft or just uh, just in your own brain? Braincraft. Is that a thing? I don't know. Hello. Hello to the Ukraine. Um, so I will start recording this podcast episode in a minute. Um, and um, But before that, I just wanted to say to hello to, hello to everyone on, on Periscope. Where do I get the podcasts? Um, just go to teacherluke.co.uk uh, or just Google Luke's English Podcast. Is that the right way round for you? When I look at that in the screen, it's sort of inverted. Anyway, it says it says Luke's English Podcast. Just It's normal, is it? Okay, that's good. Uh, just search for Luke's English Podcast on Google and you'll find it, all right? Um, otherwise, uh, you can just go to my website, which is teacherluke.co.uk. I feel like maybe I, I need to sort of stick this to something. Stick it to my forehead. Is that is that a good way to, to do this uh, periscope? I don't know if this is the best way to do it. Do you live in France? Yes, I do. Um, I guess that you've discovered me, uh, Ruam Maveras. You've probably discovered me by looking on periscopes like geographical search function, which is where you can check out the world and you see a big map and you can see where everyone is doing periscopes and um, you've, uh, <laughs> you have you see where everyone's doing periscopes and you can sort of click to... No? Oh, all right. How did you find me? I searched for teachers. Oh, okay. And you found me and here it is. This is it. So, yes, um, if you don't know me already, um, then basically I'm an English language teacher uh, I live in France at the moment. I'm based in Paris, and um, but I'm from London originally, and I teach English, and I've been teaching English for about uh, 14 years. You live in London, okay? Right. Well, I'm, I used to live in London. I'm I'm pretty much from London originally. Which part of London are you in? Who in the world does not know you? I know, I know. How how could she have not known who I was? I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Of course. Uh, n northwest, okay. Uh, northwest, sort of like Kilburn, somewhere like that. Swiss, oh, Swiss Cottage, very nice. It's a nice place. Hello, Alex. Hi. Um, so yeah, English teacher. Been teaching for fourteen years or something, um, and I also do a podcast, um, which has made me not that famous. Apparently, uh, <laughs> that's not the idea, anyway. Um, so I do this. Po Hello, new listeners. Wow, new people. All right, so lot lot. Lots of new uh, potential subjects for my podcast. Apparently my podcast is very amusing. The point of it is 
to help people to learn English and I provide a kind of um, um, the idea is to provide a kind of interesting and engaging and hopefully entertaining um, resource for people to use to practice lots and lots of listening and I teach things and uh, and also I try to entertain every now and then and that's it basically if you want to find out more just check out um, Luke's English podcast on the internet um, you've been listening since you were like 15 wow god so you're now 21 20 21 tell us what the podcast is going to be about okay so the podcast I'm going to do um, um, I, I'm basically going to continue the series of episodes that I've been doing about my holiday recently in, in uh, California. So while I was there, uh, um, I, I don't have time to explain my whole life story, to explain the whole journey that I went through in order to go on holiday to the USA. But basically it's my honeymoon. Um, I got married and our honeymoon uh, was in California and we came back about a week ago. And uh, while I was there, I decided that I would uh, make notes and things, and I brought a little audio. Um, I brought a little audio device to record myself and to interview people. And um, I didn't really interview that many people. I did interview AJ Hogue, and he will be on my podcast probably in the episode after this one. Um, that's going to be part six, which will probably be the last part because. You know, I've got to try and bring the series to a close at some point, otherwise it's going to go on forever and ever. Um, so anyway, I made loads of notes on my iPhone and like wrote a little diary. And then since I got back, I thought, right, I'll do some podcasts about my trip to California. And they ended up becoming sort of bigger and bigger uh, and longer and longer as I, you know, discovered that I had more and more to say about um, the place that I went to and so on. Um, so... Yes, it's the longest episode. Maybe, maybe. We're now, this is going to be part five that I'm going to record now. Um, I understand that on Periscope, people are going to want to ask me questions and interact with me while I'm doing the, um, the recording. But please understand that this is just a live stream um, so that you can watch me recording an episode of my podcast. So the, my main focus while I'm doing this video will be to record the episode so that means questions and things that come up, I might not be able to answer them. I might, for example, pause the podcast sometimes so I can talk to you. Uh, but my main uh, purpose is to be recording an episode of my podcast, okay? So um, I've got, you know, thousands of people who will be listening to this um, on their headphones and stuff. Uh, and they'll be listening to it just audio. So that has to be my main focus. I have to just try and think about them and make sure that it's not too visual and... Um, Obviously, they can't see this video that you're seeing and they can't see your comments and things that are coming up. So basically, uh, you might feel you might feel like I'm not speaking to you. Um, I'm speaking to the podcast people. OK. All right. Good. You got it. No, no need for me to go on and on and on about it. Um, I, I'll, I'll have to do more of these in the in the future so that I can an answer your questions specifically. But let's get on with it and let's get started. So. Um, you're not going to get all of the audio that the podcast people are going to get. And that includes some extra bits of audio. So I'll improvise. I'll find a way of, of dealing with that. So imagine, right, imagine that, um, well, you don't need to imagine. This is actually happening. Uh, this is what it's like when I, when I record an episode of Luke's English Podcast. I've already recorded that little bit at the beginning where I tell people that if they want to get an audio book, they can go to audible.com, audible trial dot com forward slash teacher Luke. I've already said that bit. Then the next bit is the jingle, <whistles> right? Which you know because you may have heard it lots of times. And then this is what comes next, and I'm going to start recording now. And um, so I've, anyway, I've got like a big setup here. I've got my mixing desk. I've got uh, my uh, audio input recorder. I've got the microphone and all that stuff set up. So uh, that's what I'm. That's what I'm using. Okay, so I've got to get myself. I've got to get myself mentally, physically, emotionally and spiritually prepared to start doing an episode of Luke's English Podcast. I've got the computer. It can, can you speak French? Uh, <laughs> kind of, well, it depends. I can, I can a little bit, but it, my French is not quite good enough. Um, okay, so again, you may write questions and comments on the feed here on Periscope. Please feel free to do that. But I will now start recording my episode of the podcast. Um, 
By the way, also, you should be able to get this video on YouTube later on, and I'm going to, if I can manage it, if the file's not too big, I will post it onto uh, the page for this episode of the podcast so you can, you can watch this again. Hi, Luke. I follow you since your first pod. Please go on. All right. Okay. All right, then. Let's go. We're going to start this episode. So this is part five in the California Road Trip series. If you want to listen to parts one, two, three, and four, teacherluke.co.uk. There you go. All right. Okay. Often what I do is when I start an episode, I make lots of mistakes and I get it all wrong and I have to stop and, and start again. And sometimes I do it 10 times because I have to get, I have to start in the right way in order to be in the, because the first minute is extremely important because that's what, that kind of defines the atmosphere of the thing and you've got to sound professional and, and so on. So, okay. Let's not muck around anymore. Stop beating around the bush, Luke. It's time to start recording. So my finger, here's my finger. I'm about to press, I'm about to press record. Okay, let's do it. You're ready. You're with me, everyone. I look like a crazy person when I do that, don't I? I'm not crazy. Far from it. Um, right. The finger is ready. Everyone is, the world's attention. I've got the attention of the world. Sort of. Well, 42 people on Periscope, which is great. I only need one finger. Here it is. Okay, people, let's do I'm going to press record, and I'm going to start recording an episode of Luke's English Podcast, and you're going to see me do it. Here we go. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Luke's English Podcast. How are you? Um, I hope that you're fine. I hope all's well. Um, here is part five in this series, which I'm doing about my California road trip. And we continue the trip in this episode in which I'm hoping to talk about these things. OK, so I'm going to talk about the Church of Scientology, uh, Yosemite National Park and our slightly dramatic adventure there and some more British and American English. And if time, I'll talk to you about San Francisco, where, among other things, I met and interviewed A.J. Hogue, who you might know from the internet because he's quite well known on the internet and he's got a learning English system which is called Effortless English. I think that I won't get to AJ Hogue in this episode, that's probably going to be in the next one which I also imagine will be the last uh, in this series of like California road trip uh, episodes. So let's get started. Okay, I should say as well that while I'm recording this uh, I'm also doing a live stream on Periscope and I've got some people joining me here on Periscope and um, so, yeah, live stream. So this is the first time that I've ever done this. Um, and uh, someone's already asking me, is this Periscope broadcast brought to us by Audible? Yeah, if you like. Yeah, why not? In fact, uh, yeah, you could say so. Yes, the, the, uh, maybe the Periscope is brought to you by Audible. I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a bit. Now, you might be thinking, if you're listening to this podcast, you might be thinking, oh, wait a minute, I wish I'd known about that. I wish I'd known, if I had known that you were going to do um, a live broadcast on Periscope while you were recording this, then I would have watched it. Which, if, if, to be honest, if you, if you are thinking that, then well done, because that is quite a complex sentence that involves a number of complicated conditional uh, uh, structures. Um, if I had known that you were going to record an episode of the podcast using Periscope at the same time, then I would have decided to listen to it. Don't worry about the complexities of third conditionals at this point. But anyway, um, I'm planning to upload the video of the Periscope onto the page for this episode. If my phone can handle it, depending on the size of the file, but hopefully I'll, you'll be able to see this again by watching it on YouTube. All right. Um, now then, now, so we continue the road trip story and um, so I, in the previous episodes I talked to you about time I spent in Los Angeles and stuff. So at this point, um, 11th of August, I think it was the 11th of August, we decided to, well, we prepared to drive uh, from Los Angeles to, Yo to Yosemite National Park. And we went to uh, CVS, which is like this huge um, pharmacy uh, and we stocked up on water and other supplies because it's quite a long journey. So, we, you know, we thought we'd need to get lots of supplies and things. Uh, we programmed the SatNav, uh, that, the SatNav, that's the uh, GPS, Satellite Navigation System. 
We programmed the sat-nav to take us on a route um, on the western side of the Sierra Nevada um, via Bakersfield and Fresno, and then up, I think it's Highway 41 into Yosemite, which is a really nice drive. Um, and in Yosemite National Park, we've managed to book uh, a spot in a camping ground. And at that, at that point, we were both really looking forward to being in the fresh air and in the mountains. But before we left for um, Yosemite, we decided to stop and have a big, uh, a big breakfast in a, in a recommended cafe where they do awesome pancakes with whipped cream, maple syrup and free re refills of coffee. You know, those really big delicious American style pancakes and you cover loads of and I mean they're quite unhealthy in the first place these pancakes but it seems to be customary to add all sorts of other unhealthy ingredients on the top like you add maple syrup and whipped cream and things like that uh, admittedly the pancakes that I did have in this cafe also had lots of fresh fruit like cut strawberries and bananas and things on the top which obviously made it okay but there was still tons of sugar and, and stuff in there um, but I love those pancakes. They're so delicious. So we stopped. We, the plan was to stop off in this cafe and we parked the car and walked up the street to get to the cafe. And then suddenly we came across this huge, imposing building, a massive uh, at the end of the street, this massive, imposing looking building. And it was um, it was bright blue, uh, massive and weirdly painted bright blue. Uh, what was it? Well, this was the headquarters of the Church of Scientology. Um, and so at this point in the episode, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about Scientology, which I consider to be a fascinating and, here's that word again, mysterious aspect of California life. Um, now, what is the Church of Scientology? I imagine that some of you know about the Church of Scientology already. Um, uh, let me let me talk to you a little bit about it. In fact, first of all, what I'm going to do now is play a recording that I made um, on my little audio recorder at that moment. So we parked the car and um, I switched on the audio recorder and started talking about what I could see. So I'm going to play that recording to you right now. OK, Periscope, I've just paused the podcast because what I will do is in post-production... I'm going to add that recording in, but um, you'll have to listen to the episode of the podcast to actually hear what I said at the time. So basically what I said was, oh look, big blue building, that's weird, I think it's the Church of Scientology, pretty much. Um, okay, so let's imagine that you've heard that recording, and ah ha 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 nice one. Uh, yeah, I know, exactly, the Church of Scientology, Tom Cruise will like the post, well, will he? I wonder if he will like the post. It's, it's interesting. Let me continue. Okay, here we go. Um, so, okay, so what is the Church of Scientology? Well, let me tell you a little bit about it. It's a religion uh, and quite a controversial one. Some people call it a cult. Some of its members are famous celebrities like Tom Cruise and John Travolta. Apparently, the church has a lot of influence in Hollywood and lots of people think it's really weird and secretive. There are even suggestions uh, that the church has been involved in criminal activity like threats, assault and even uh, more serious things than that. Um, those are just allegations and suggestions. Again, um, as I said, these are just allegations, but it's pretty mysterious and fascinating, like something from some kind of weird mystery novel or something. I recently saw a very interesting documentary about Scientology called Going Clear in which lots of, lots of ex-members of the church, and these are people who decided to leave for one reason or another, lots of ex-members of the church um, uh, explain what it's really like, what the church is really like, and they don't, they don't say very positive things. Um, in fact, the documentary seems to suggest that Scientology is a power-hungry cult which takes money from its members and threatens them with retribution if they try to leave. There are also suggestions that the church committed crimes like burglary, theft and intimidation in order to avoid having to pay a huge tax bill to the US government. Bold claims indeed. So what is really going on inside this weird blue building? So here's a brief history of Scientology. 
Okay, I'm going to give you a brief history of, of Scientology, and this time I'm going to paraphrase a summary of Scientology that I found uh, on the For Dummies website. Uh, so, For Dummies is a series of books that help to explain various complex subjects in simple terms. You might know the series already because they have uh, distinctive yellow covers. Um, so, For Dummies, for example, you get... Um, you know, English history for dummies. Dummies means stupid people. The idea is that they kind of explain complicated subjects in simple ways so that even dummies or idiots can understand them. So, of course, I love the series. Um, so, uh, um, it's a really good series. They have books on almost every subject. For example, a quick look at the, the For Dummies series on Audible. Um, if I have a quick look at that, I'll give you an example of some of the titles that you can find. If I just go onto audible.com uh, for dummies, just search for it. And we have things like Spanish for dummies, cognitive behavioral therapy for dummies, Freemasons for dummies, investing for dummies, home buying for dummies, Catholicism for dummies, Irish history for dummies, uh, French for dummies. I think I need to get that one. Um, small businesses for dummies um, and so on in um, what else British history for dummies um, and so on okay so you've got all these different versions um, anyway so um, for dummies also have a website with clear and fairly brief summaries of different subjects so let's check out um, the summary for Scientology um, you can check the link on the page for this episode um, so what I'm going to say is based on information in that summary, but, I, but also what I learned from the Scientology pamphlets that I've read and also what I learned from several documentaries that I've seen. Okay, so the Church of Scientology was set up in 1953 by a writer called L. Ron Hubbard. Now, Hubbard was already fairly successful at the time as a writer of both science fiction stories and then self-help books. And his most successful self-help book explored the relationship between body and mind, and he called it Dianetics. Uh, the Dianetics book became the basis um, of the religion that he then set up, which he called Scientology. Now, some critics say that, that Dianetics is just quackery. Quackery means not proper science, basically, kind of fake science or not proper, not proper science because it's not... Uh, subject to the proper levels of testing and quality standards that you expect from genuine science or psychiatry, okay? So this is what critics say about Dianetics, um, that it's just quackery and that he only set it up Scientology as a religion because it was a tax dodge, just a way to avoid having to pay lots of tax. These are, this is what the critics say. In the USA, religions don't have to pay tax, you see. So Hubbard is criticised for having a cynical reason for making his religion in the first place so that he could make money, or worse, maybe, that he was just power hungry. Whatever the reason, Scientology was set up as a religion in the USA. Um, now, L. Ron Hubbard, as the creator of Scientology, is loved by the Scientologists, of course, but he's viewed with a lot more sus suspicion by many non-members of the church. For example, the French government, who considered him to be a fraudster and tried to convict him of customs violations in the 1970s. Um, Britain, Greece, Spain, Portugal and Venezuela all closed their ports to, um, to L. Ron Hubbard's fleet of boats in the 1970s. At one point, a court in Australia revoked the church's status as a religion. Um, that was a quote, by the way, that they are just read from Wikipedia. Uh, these are all reasons why he went into hiding in the 1970s. And to go into hiding means to leave the place where you live and go to a place where nobody can find you. So he was the leader, of dis you know, even during these periods when he disappeared and went into hiding, he was the leader of the, um, of the church um, right up until he died in 1986. So I've just paused the podcast again. Someone said, it's incredible how you can speak for so long without pausing. Um... Well, yeah, I suppose so. Um, I, no, thank you. That's very nice of you to say that. But you know that I'm reading a lot of this. I've got a computer right here in front of me, and I'm actually reading a lot of the things I'm saying because I've kind of spent time preparing the episode. So, um, you know, bear that in mind. 
that I am, I've written all, most of this and I'm actually reading it to you now. Sometimes uh, I don't do that on the podcast. Sometimes I'll just um, decide to do episodes that are completely uh, unprepared or uh, episodes that uh, don't involve some kind of transcript or something. And I think that's good for you to listen to. So yes, I do have a script for this one because I prepared all of this in advance. Uh, for, yeah, someone's just mentioned the Pink Gorilla story. People often refer to that one as an example of episodes where I don't have a script and I just randomly make something up, up off the top of my head. Uh, but in this particular case, um, there's a script. Are the Paul and Amber ones scripted? No, they're not. No. No, they're not. Definitely not. Um, um, someone said it's a sort of jazz speaking. That's I like that. Um, so, no, the Paul and Amber episodes are not scripted. Um, no, but this particular one is, just because um, I, d I felt the need to prepare a lot more in advance. So some of the episodes have uh, scripts, which you can find on the page, and some episodes are completely sort of, you know, um, created in, this, in, in, the, in the moment. I would love to find audible books with English accent. Could you advise? Yes, you need to just listen to all my podcasts, because in almost every episode... Uh, I mention episode. I, I mention um, books uh, that you can download from Audible. Um, someone said, "Show the script." You, you don't believe me? <laughs> can you see that? I don't know if you could see that. Um, now I'm actually looking at what you've done for this podcast. I almost I feel almost guilty for of enjoying it for free. Someone says, "Well, you don't have to. You don't have to feel guilty." There's a simple solution to that. You just send me a donation and then you'll feel all right. That's, I say that sort of ironically, but, you know, if you want to donate, you can. Um, you can find little donate buttons on the website. You can just donate. You can choose how much you want to donate. Uh, it's up to you completely. Um, just don't feel obliged. Please don't feel obliged to donate. But at the same time, uh, you know, you can if you want to. All right? Because that's, that's how this whole thing works. You can just take... Or, or uh, you can just take what I've done, and that's fine. Or you, you can send me something as compensation. What I like to think is, uh, imagine if you've, if, if you've got everything I've done on the podcast in the form of a book that you just picked up on off a shelf. It would have to be a pretty big book, right? It's a huge book with loads of DVDs and CDs attached to it and stuff. And you think, oh my God, look at this huge volume of work. How much is this? And the guy behind the counter goes, well, how much do you think it should be? Which is a sort of weirdly mysterious answer. Um, anyway, just if you want to donate, then you can. And that's it. Someone said, what happened with the Skypod? Why are you sitting in the room? Well, this is the Skypod. Um, yeah, I know. It's not quite as uh, exciting as, as, as I make it sound sometimes. But you're not getting the whole picture. Um, I've just... Um, I've got to get back to the episode at some point. I can't keep doing doing these uh, these moments like this. So yeah, I am in the Skypod. Look, you can see the view. There you go. There's a view of the Eiffel Tower. I'm very lucky to have this view. It sounded more glamorous. Well, of course it did. <laughs> That's the joke, really, if, for me. Uh, maybe it's not a very good joke because no one gets it. But no, you, you're not getting the whole three and three sixty degree view. There's a window here that you can see. There's another window on the left over there, and there's another window on the right over there. And behind me here is a wall, um, and so like much of a sky pod. But from my point of view, it 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 does. Um, so that's why I call it the sky pod. Right, I've got to get back to this episode. This is a bit complicated, isn't it? Because what I'm doing is I'm trying to do a, a periscope, and I'm trying to record an episode of my podcast at the same time. And it's I feel like I'm multitasking. And as you know, you know. They always say that men can't multitask, um, but I don't agree with that. I think that men can multitask. It's just complicated. Uh, maybe what I should do in the future is um, just do periscopes and just do podcasts because doing the two at the same time is a bit difficult because I'm sort of, uh, you know, which one am I doing? Am I talking to you or am I talking to the, the podcast people? bit complicated, isn't it? But this is the first time I've done this. So, you know, I'm just experimenting, just trying it out. Let's carry on. This, I imagine this periscope is going to go on. Unless I stop it uh, after a certain amount of time, it could go on 
because usually my podcast episodes are about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes long. Um, so just to let you know. Um, all right, now let's carry on. Where was I? Where was I? I said um, I, I was talking about L. Ron Hubbard and, and the Church of Scientology. You, you know about the Church of Scientology, don't you? I wonder if you do. Anyway, I'm going to tell you more now. Um, all right, so I'm now going to press uh, record again. And we'll carry on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good. Here we go then. So what do Scientologists actually do? Well, you can walk into a Scientology centre in many cities in the world now and have a counselling session. In fact, you might be invited in for one. When I used to live in London, I used to walk past the Scientology centre in central London. I think it was on the Tottenham Court Road. And they would sometimes ask me if I wanted a stress test. Um... And I always said no, because I felt that that was just a way for them to get me into the centre. And um, I imagined it would be a bit like this. Like, um, hi, how are you feeling a bit stressed out today? Would you like a free stress test? And then you kind of go, mm, yeah, all right. And then you go in and they check you out and they tell you that you're feeling very stressed and that stress is very harmful and that, in fact, they have all the solutions to how to combat stress and to live a more effective life and of course it's all the principles of Scientology and they say here's a leaflet and here's a DVD would you like to sign up for a course and if you're kind of convinced by the kind of sales pitch that they've given you there and then and you're convinced by the fact that you do have high levels of stress according to their stress meter and uh, that you know you feel more relaxed after them you know and you maybe you feel oh my god I've got high levels of stress what, what do I need to do and they're right there with all the answers and it all seems very clear. So that's kind of one of the ways that they might kind of recruit you into the Church of Scientology, for example. Sounds okay, I suppose, doesn't it? I expect that it is helpful for, for many people, certainly at the beginning. But personally, it's just not for me. It's not something that um, uh, I'm, I'm interested in. Um, so a counselling session at the Church of Scientology is, uh, is called an audit. Um, essentially, this is a bit like a psycho psychotherapy session. So you're invited to share deeply personal things in order to free yourself from emotional burdens. Okay, um, so this is the, the audit. You sit down with an auditor and they hook you up to a machine which is called the e-meter. I'll tell you a little bit more about the e-meter in a second. So the counselling session is, is like a, a kind of therapy session they call it an audit, um, almost like a confession to an extent. Um, you're invited to share deeply personal things in order to free yourself from emotional burdens. It does sound like Freudian psychoanalysis a little bit, doesn't it? But in fact, Scientology completely rejects psychoanalysis. And apparently Scientology is the only way. Okay? During these auditing, auditing sessions, you're hooked up to a machine which is called an e-meter. Essentially, you hold on to these metal things which um, somehow measure electromagnetic uh, currents in your hands, okay? Uh, so you hold on to these metal cylinders during the audit. Um, according to Scientology, the e-meter can measure your thoughts, but it's not just as simple as thoughts. Apparently it's related to immortal spirits from space which inhabit our bodies and prevent us from living a healthy and happy life. OK, um, so anyway, auditing allows us to set these spirits free, which makes us feel better. Um, critics say uh, that the uh, e-meter just measures electromagnetic energy in your hands and is no more revealing about your mind than a crude, a crude lie detector test. But according to Scientology, if an e-meter is used by a Scientology minister, then it really works. And freeing yourself from levels of emotional burden in these auditing sessions is called going clear. And there are different stages of clarity. In order to achieve those levels of clarity, you need to do more and more audits, share more and more personal problems, and also contribute more and more things to the church. This costs quite a lot of money, of course, as courses of, uh, as, as courses of auditing are not cheap. And all of this goes to the church. And also all the private and personal things that you've said in auditing sessions are recorded and kept by the church. Now they say that these things are confidential, but nevertheless they do keep all of the things that you've said, all the deep personal secrets that you've revealed in, in your sessions. The aim is to free yourself of all your emotional burdens and achieve a state of perfect clarity. 
Apparently the Church of Scientology is very rich as they have purchased some incredible pieces of real estate around the world, such as the massive blue building in Los Angeles. It's not very clear exactly how much power, that, how much power they have. Some people say that they exert some influence in Hollywood's entertainment industry. So what do Scientologists believe? Well, um, Scientologists believe that people are just, in fact, just receptacles for immortal spirits which came down to earth many years ago. The church doesn't like it if these spirits are called aliens. It doesn't, doesn't like the word aliens because, it, you know, it sounds bad if you say that you believe in aliens, doesn't it? I mean, it doesn't sound very sort of reasonable. It sounds a bit mad, let's say. Uh, so let's not call them aliens. Apparently these immortal spirits live within us and they're trapped inside us and they can only be freed by going through these auditing sessions until eventually you get to the top level of clarity when I guess the, the, the aliens, I mean spirits, sorry, um, are freed and they go somewhere else. I'm not sure of the details of what exactly happens to these spirits or if in fact we are the spirits ourselves or what they look like or anything like that. I'm not sure. So anyway, there you go. In the end, that's what the Scientologists believe. OK, fair enough. I think we're all entitled to our beliefs. So, But what is it that's so controversial about them? Now, uh, I'm now going to read a quote from the page um, on the Four Dummies website about Scientology. And this bit is written by Scott Barnes, and you can find the link on the page for this episode. Um, and it goes like this. Scientology is one of the most controversial religious movements of our time. Many people reduce their worldview to nothing more than a cult that brainwashes its members and then fleeces them, that's basically like sort of cons them, by charging outrageous fees for some auditing classes. Critics uh, lambast the church for its rejection of established psychiatry and many people take issue with the church's celebrity centres, which are facilities that are technically open to the public but primarily serve the most famous Scientologists in the arts, sports and government. Think people like Tom Cruise, Isaac Hayes and Nancy Cartwright, for example. Reports from some who have left the Church of Scientology are even more incriminating and include stories of church members being held for years against their wills at rehab rehabilitation camps for violating certain policies or sending members to go through the trash of the church's critics and former members to find material to blackmail them into silence. In 1979, several Scientology members were convicted for participating in the largest theft of government documents in the United States history. Scientologists have also been accused of tampering with witnesses in court cases and even murder. In response to these claims, Scientologists state that their religion is genuine and that the movement has been distorted by the press and that they are being persecuted. Um, so, that was a quote from um, uh, Scott Barnes on Scientology for Dummies um, on the For Dummies website. Um, so, among the criticisms of Scientology are these things. That's, and these are things that Scientology has been criticised for. Scientology pr apparently preys upon people who want to make it in Hollywood by suggesting that the church can help them and then they force them to stay in the church with the suggestion that they can harm their careers due to the extensive connections in the business. OK, an allegation, not necessarily my point of view, just reporting on other people's criticisms. Uh, uh, another criticism, they illegally registered an investigation into their accounts by the IRS, that they bully their members and then blackmail high profile members like Tom Cruise and Tra John Travolta into staying in the church. Remember that the church has recordings of all those extensive and deeply personal auditing sessions. These are all allegations and criticisms, of course, which have been made against the church, not necessarily my thoughts. I haven't decided what I think of them yet, and I'm just curious. Is it possible that all of this sinister stuff is actually going on within these imposing blue buildings that we saw? I wonder. I'd, li I'd now like to play you a second recording. Um, that I made on the day that I was there. So let me now play that recording for you on the podcast. Pause the podcast there. Um, so 
what on in the podcast episode you'll hear another recording that I made when I was standing outside the the, the church. I think actually the second recording is in the cafe, and you can see through the window. You can see the the the, the building through the window. So that's what you're going to get when you listen to this um, on the the podcast. How are you doing in Periscope Land? How are you? You're all right. Lots of hearts there. Lots of red coloured hearts. That's nice. Lovely to see. Uh, great. Thanks, Alex. All right. Yeah. Good. That's nice. Glad to hear that. See, Joanna. World's Builder is still here. Still building worlds. That's nice to know. Um, great. Okay. Good. Shall I, shall I carry on? Shall I keep going? Do you want me to continue? Shall I just stop? Yes, of course. Okay, good. Good. All right. Okay, let's keep going then. And so the podcast is really interesting. Oh, thank you very much. I'm glad you say that. Sometimes I'm sometimes I wonder. Sometimes I think, God, I hope that they're following all of this. I hope that they're managing to keep up with what I'm doing. Uh Christina is on the bus. That's cool, isn't it? That you can you can follow this on the bus. You must have a pretty good internet connection on your phone. Okay, so you're all doing okay. Alright, I've just noticed that there's a door downstairs. There is a door, um, I think it's the toilet door, which is blowing in the wind a little bit and it keeps going like that, which is really annoying. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to give you a look at the view again and I'm going to really quickly rush downstairs and close that door properly so it stops annoying me, okay? So this is like a little moment of drama in the uh, podcast video where I have to rush downstairs in order to close the door. I'm going to of Paris for a, for a moment, okay? Back in a second. I'll try not to fall down the stairs. Okay, here we go. Okay, I did it, I did it. I'm back. Whew. Okay. What's happened to my hair? It's hot when you move around a lot. 3G should be enough to watch a stream. Oh, okay. I didn't know all the technical details. It's, it's hot when you're running around. Oh, no, I'm feeling all self-conscious because I'm on video. Um, okay. Yeah, it's a beautiful view, isn't it? Hello, what's going on? Hello, I'm in the middle of a live recording of an episode of Luke's English Podcast. I'm slightly out of breath because I just went down stairs to close a door. Okay, this is my exciting life. I'm afraid I have to go. See you later if possible. Okay, Joanna, bye-bye. Have a nice day. Um, so I'm in the middle of a recording an episode of Luke's English Podcast and I'm doing a live Periscope at the same time. If you don't know who I am, my name's Luke Thompson and I produce and record episodes. My hairdo is interesting to say the least. All right, that's good. So uh, I, I record episodes of Luke's English Podcast if you don't know who I am, check out Luke's English Podcast on the internet. It's a podcast for people who are learning English. And I've been doing it for, what, six years? Um, that's not going to work. I've been doing it for six years and uh, it's very popular. I've got listeners all over the world, including lots of people in Russia and Poland and Spain and Italy and Brazil and all sorts of other places. And I've won awards. Pe people voted for me saying that they like the podcast. So where can we get those stickers? I used, to, I used to sell these stickers and I used to sell mugs and t-shirts but um, I decided to close the shop because I felt that the prices of my products were too high and I didn't want to, I, I just, I, you know, basically I was selling some of this stuff through a company and the company did everything. They printed it all, they did all of the postage, they basically handled all of it because the the issue is with selling merchandise for me is that I have an audience all around the world and so it's very complicated for me to be able to sell to everyone around the world at a reasonable price because that's quite a large operation. So I got this company online to do it all for me but of course they took something like 95% of all of the profit from it and, uh, and also the, the costs were too high, the, the prices were too high. Okay, so I thought I don't want to make my listeners pay too much for this stuff. And I don't want people to think that I'm ripping them off. I didn't get it. I, I, of all the stuff I sold, um, I guess, when was it? The sort of first half of this year, I made about £50. 
and lots of people paid like what I consider to be too high, too much money for stuff. So I decided to stop it. Um, there you go. But even in the beginning, I always thought that it was going to be a limited time only thing anyway. Um, so, so there you go. So that there used to be stickers available, but they're not available anymore. Limited edition, ladies and gentlemen, limited edition. Um, I might bring them back. I might bring them back. You're a stand-up guy. Hey, thanks very much. I'm a stand-up guy. Uh, says R.A.M. Garman. I, I am literally a stand-up guy um, in several ways. Do you know? What a, does everyone else know what that means? Hey, you're a stand-up guy. It means you're a, you're a nice guy. Thanks. Um, it also I, I also do stand-up. So in a sense, I am a, I am a stand-up. <laughs> oh my God! Put it on auction and boom. You think, you think so? You think that's going to make money on an auction? Maybe. Who knows? There's only one way to find out. Put it on eBay and I'll see what happens. See, We'll see what happens there anyway. Right, so I'm in the middle of recording an episode of this podcast. We'll buy it for one million. One million what? One million yen? <laughs> one million yen is not that much. Um, okay, so I'm in the middle of doing a podcast episode and... Uh, uh, oh, thanks. Uh, so... I've just played, imagine I've just played the second recording where I'm in a cafe and I'm just thinking about entering the Scientology building in order to try and speak to someone. Um, so that's what I've just played. So now let's carry on with the podcast. Are you ready, ladies and gents? You okay with that? I'm going to keep doing the podcast now. Following on audio boom. All right. All right, good. You're back again. Hello. Okay, then let's let's carry on with this episode. All right, here we go then. So as we continue episode 292 uh, on the podcast, we are about 20, 20 minutes into the episode and I'm talking about the Church of Scientology. So here we go. Okay, so um, at that point I decided that I would try and talk to someone um, and I felt a bit excited and a bit nervous because I know the church can be a bit touchy about people doing recordings or making documentaries about them, which I suppose is understandable. Um, anyway, I decided that I wanted to talk to someone, so I went over to some of the people in uniform who were walking around the building. I left the cafe and I walked over the road and I tried to talk to one of the people outside the building. And I spoke to a woman who was actually very nice and, well, let's say normal, I mean, of course. Uh, I told her I was making a holiday diary and that I'd just come across the building and I wanted to interview someone about it. And she took me into the building and I spoke to someone in reception. And then I made a recording afterwards. So I actually went into the building. Um, I, I walked around the building with her. We made a bit of small talk. And I tried to sort of, you know, um, play it down a bit. I didn't want to go in and say, I'm making a, uh, an investigative documentary about the Church of Scientology uh, and I want to ask someone some very tough and challenging critical questions because obviously that wouldn't get me anywhere. Instead I, was, I said I'm just making a holiday diary which is true because it is a holiday diary um, and I'm just really curious about this building and I was just wondering if there was someone who could answer some questions for me. And she took me around and we, I went into reception and then uh, then I made another recording afterwards when I came out, and I'm now going to play that recording to you. So here we go. I paused the podcast again. So you have to imagine that you hear a recording um, that I made after I'd been in the building, and you can listen to that on the podcast. But I'm now going to carry on. I've got a very itchy nose. Oh, the the problems of a of, of a podcaster when you have an itchy nose. See, normally in the podcast I can just rub my nose as much as I like. Sorry if that's a bit, that seems a bit rude, doesn't it? Uh, if you're watching this on video. On the, when I'm doing the audio thing, I can just do whatever I want, you know, I can pick my nose. Um, not that I do, of course I don't do that. It's disgusting. Um, I can do whatever I want, but uh, now I've got video, I've got to be, pay attention to the fact that everyone can see quite close up. So here's a question. Do you like the American accent? Um, I know what you want me to say. When you ask that, uh, I always get asked that question. I know what people want me to say. They want me to say, no, I hate the American accent. It's ridiculous. It's, it's like, a, uh, like they're destroying uh, beautiful English. 
and it's you know and they, yeah, they all speak like this and it's like totally uh, that's what people want me to say um i don't mind i quite like the american accent um uh, I, I quite enjoy speaking to Americans and there are lots of different accents that I really enjoy in the USA and it depends on the individual I think not in Alabama <laughs> I don't know I quite enjoy that kind of um, Midwestern sort of Southern American or whatever that countryside voice that you get in the States I quite enjoy that kind of accent I suppose if I lived there and I had to listen to it all the time, it would probably get a little bit grating after a while. But uh, I'm fine with American English, really. Um, and I think that it's that in America you get some people who are... God damn! Yeah. Some people in America are fantastic and great, and you get some really interesting people with really broad-minded ideas and, you know, great music and culture and stuff. And, of course, some people are really annoying and, and small-minded. Um, so, also, and that comes through in the accents. Some people's accents, they just sound annoying because of something in the personality of the person who's speaking. Um, and yet, equally, some people sound great. So, I don't think all American people are, uh, are, are stupid or anything. And I certainly don't think that all American accents sound bad. I think it depends on the individual and there are lots of Americans, so of course there's going to be lots of individuals who are a bit annoying, but equally lots of individuals who aren't. God damn! You sure can speak good on your podcast! There you go, that was my... I don't know which accent that is. I don't know which accent that is in... in a, uh, mm, no, no good. That's a sort of a Forrest Gump thing, you know. Uh, laugh is like a box of chocolates or something. I don't know. Oh my god! You sure can speak good uh, with your... Where are you from? Um, you from British? Where are you from? You ain't from around here, are you? Strange around here, huh? Yeah. We don't take too kindly to strangers around these parts. You ain't from around here, are you? Where are you from, huh? Yes. Seriously, you sound pretty wasted. I'm not. I'm fine. It's, I mean, it's 12 o'clock. Uh, <laughs> yeehaw! Yes, exactly. What I was doing there, I was doing a, 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 a sort of cartoon version of uh, a, a, some sort of hillbilly American. Clint Eastwood. Well, I guess you got to ask yourself a question. Do you feel lucky? Um, yes. So you're going to... Are you going to keep recording your episode of your podcast, or are you going to whistle Dixie? Okay. Um, now then, let's get back to Luke's English podcast, all right? Uh, let's stop messing around. Um, so, we're going to continue. I'm now going to press the play button, the record button. And, uh, phew, it's hot up here. It really is. Okay, ready? Here we go. Um, so, there you go. That The woman I spoke to seemed pretty happy and seemed very proud to be working at the organization and the place certainly looked very smart and clean and many members of the church say that it has helped them a lot but what about all those allegations what about the documentaries and stuff tell me what you think everyone okay what do you think is the church a cult or is it a proper religion in your mind is it a force for good or is it a not a force for good is there a church of scientology in your country where do you where you come from Tell me what you think about the Church of Scientology, okay? I'd like to know your views. As ever, you can leave your comments on the page for this episode of the podcast. This is episode 292. Just go down to the comments section right at the bottom of the page. Just type, type a little comment. I'd like to know what you think. Okay, I've got a comment here on Periscope because I'm periscoping this while I'm doing it. And someone just said it's just a profitable company, really. Uh-huh. Okay, interesting. Uh, but they're, they're not listed as a company, are they? They're listed as a religion. So it's not really, not exactly operating like a company. They don't, they're not um, subject to the same level of check, checks that companies are. Mm, it's interesting. And someone, another person is saying, yes, there's, there's something very shady about them. Yeah, there is something a bit shady about the, the church. Um, Anyway, let's move on, shall we, everyone? Let's move on. I'm going to tell you about the next place that we went to on the California road trip. And the next place was Yosemite National Park. 
Now, um, many of you may have been there, you might have seen it. In fact, you might have Apple Macintosh computers that have a um, Yosemite operating system. And if you've got the uh, Yosemite operating system on your Mac, then you've probably seen the desktop wallpaper images of Yosemite National Park. That's Yosemite, okay? It's an incredibly stunning place, and it's um, also, you know, uh, an operating system on Apple Mac computers. So I actually went into the, I went to Yosemite, which was like going into my Mac. It was actually like climbing into the operating system on, of my Mac. Um, so anyway, Yosemite, it's a huge national park and probably one of the most stunning parks in the world. Um, most of the tourism there is centered on Yosemite Valley, which is full of meadows, a river and pine trees and some accommodation and camping grounds. Around the valley, you have some incredible granite rock formations, including stunning mountains. Uh, and there are granite rock faces like El Capitan, the Half Dome, Sentinel Dome and so on. Also some of the highest waterfalls in the world. Um, the whole thing combines to be a stunning place to spend some time camping, cycling, hiking or rock climbing. And it's visited by about 5 million people per year. Uh, there are a few roads that go around the central part of the park surrounding the valley. 95% of the park is wilderness and hardly any people go there except experienced hikers. So that's the other 95%. Most people spend time in the in the valley, which is about five percent of the the whole park. Okay, uh, the other ninety five percent is mainly wilderness, and hardly any people go there except experienced hikers, climbers, and campers. You might know Yosemite, as I just mentioned, uh, from the Apple Mac operating system. Um, at the time I'm recording this podcast, I think the most recent OS for Mac is Yosemite, but I believe that uh, the next one is going to be called El Capitan. Um, which is also a rock face in Yosemite National Park. Um, so if you have a Mac with Yosemite, then you've probably seen the desktop images of the place. It's absolutely stunning. And being there is a bit like being inside your own Apple Mac, but obviously much, much better than that, because nothing can compare with actually seeing it with your own eyes and, um, and smelling the smells and hearing the sounds and just being part of the general atmosphere of being there. So we drove the... Uh, muscle car that we were driving, that uh, I was driving, we drove the Chevy Camaro out of Los Angeles and then through the back end of the Hollywood Hills and there they have some very handsome countryside with, uh, with um, a highway which is great for driving. Uh, I mean in LA it's, it's not really that great for driving because it's just traffic jams all the time and you just inching forwards and if you're driving yeah I know should have brought a Mustang someone is saying I know that uh, oh hi that's uh, Roman from Switzerland yeah I should have brought I should have got a Mustang tell me about it um, sorry that I'm just talking to someone on, on Periscope anyway um, uh, so in LA of course you're just creeping through traffic all the time lots of traffic jams which can be a bit annoying when you're in a big powerful car because the car wants to it wants to go, it wants to leap forwards, as I said in, in a previous episode. Um, but then driving to Yosemite was the first time that I'd really sort of taken the car out on a, on a proper open highway. Um, so after those hills, the, the land does become a bit boring between Los Angeles and Yosemite. There's a big stretch of a few hours in the middle, which is just boring flat farmland. But the driving is fun. It, the driving was fun in this Camaro, which really comes into its own on the open highway. Um, and I, I realised, um, while I was driving to Yosemite, I realised that I'd hardly put my foot down for the whole time. In fact, most of the driving in LA um, has just been slow cruising or edging forwards in traffic. So at that point, on the open highway, I decide to floor the Camaro with some space ahead, and it reveals masses of hidden power roaring and leaping forwards with yet more revs all the time. It seems that they have about nine gears, these cars, and each single gear is designed to go like that. It's completely uh, incredible. Um, so, yeah, the whole, the whole time in LA, I'd just sort of been pushing the accelerator a little bit down, and this is the first chance I had to actually push the accelerator to the floor. In a normal car, you know, if you're driving up a hill, you, you have to push the accelerator to the floor in order to kind of, you know, get up the hill comfortably. In this thing, uh, I just touch the accelerator and it deals with hills and everything fine. 
and as I said, open highway, put my foot down, and we were thrown back into our seats. We were already going about 70 miles an hour when I put the foot down, and we were thrown back into our seats, and it seemed to move between about three gears and suddenly leapt forwards. At, I mean, I don't know what kind of revs it's got and you know what kind of level of torque it has and things like that but anyway uh, that was exciting and fun um, so um, so the Camaro just ate up all the highway and we eventually arrived in a town called Fresno after about four hours of driving now Fresno um, um, Fresno in my experience is just mall land it's just shopping malls everywhere I don't know if it's just that we missed the main part of Fresno but According to the map that we were using, we did drive through the center of it. Um, and um, so Fresno seemed to be just mall land, just more shopping mall after shopping mall after shopping mall. Just seems to be one giant shopping mall. So maybe we were in the commercial district and there's just an open mall after open mall. But anyway, we decided to pick one that had a Whole Foods supermarket and um, we got some sushi. Um, now, we love Whole Foods. I don't know if you have Whole Foods in, in where you are, but Whole Foods is like a big, um, it's a huge sort of healthy food supermarket. And they have lots of different types of healthy food um, and they do, there's a big salad bar and they also serve sushi in, in Whole Foods as well. It's a really great place. So Whole Foods is like Mecca to us. Um, it's like a place that we go on a pilgrimage to whenever we can. Um, London has a few Whole Foods. Paris has none at this point. I wonder if uh, there are Whole Foods supermarkets in your countries. So what's so great about Whole Foods? Well, they're normal in the USA. Um, and I've, I've just mentioned that they're full of really good, you know, uh, healthy food. And they're massive and they have a really wide selection and loads of good stuff. Um, this Whole Foods that we went to in Fresno was not so good. And the sushi that we ate there was not that great. Maybe because of our expectations were too high because... You know, after driving for four hours, it's like, we've got to get to Whole Foods. And then we got there and, and the, the, the food was not that good. Also, it was absolutely freezing inside this Whole Foods. And um, in fact, that's something that we noticed a lot in the States is that indoors, it's freezing cold because of the air conditioning. So outside, it can be boiling hot and indoors, absolutely freezing. So, you know, we would be sort of rubbing rubbing our arms trying to keep warm wrapping ourselves up in as many layers of clothing as possible just to try and keep warm in these places because of the aggressive air conditioning it's really odd normally here um in europe normally it's it, you know in the summer it's hot inside and it's cooler outside and you go outside to get some air and to to you know get a breeze and so on um in the states it's the opposite it's freezing cold inside boiling hot outside yeah, uh, just a difference. So we wandered around mall land in Fresno looking for supplies. And then we drove to Yosemite in the mid to late afternoon. It took a couple of hours. The landscape more, got more and more interesting as we climbed up through the winding highway. And at this point, there was some really wonderful driving as we kind of climbed up through these, these curved roads as the, the landscape picked up and it started. We, we kind of entered the foothills of the Sierra Nevada and the, 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 the kind of plant life around us changed and the trees started to change. And it was mainly at that point kind of, um, 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 what do you call them, pine trees and so on. Uh, and you can smell the pine trees, you know, so we drove with the windows open and the sun on our faces through these trees. Really nice. And then eventually we got to the Yosemite and we started to glimpse views of these stunning granite formations. Basically, in order to get into Yosemite National Park, you have to drive up, up, up and up and up and then over the sort of over the top, as it were, and then back down into one of the valleys. Um, so once we got into the valley, you started to see glimpses of these amazing granite rock formations. But we kept going because uh, we had to get to our, our campsite. And at one point we went into a tunnel and then on the other side of the tunnel, there's this incredible view. And in fact, that's a, a fairly well-known spot. It's called Tunnel View, one of the best places to view, um, you know, the whole valley. So we drove through the tunnel and then suddenly on the other side, this incredible valley view opened out on the left-hand side. And it was basically my Mac desktop. You know, it was just like, just like being inside your own Mac desktop. Imagine the biggest Apple Mac display that you can think of. 
that's what it was like. You know, super high definition and in 3D as well. We were actually there. Um, so from the, inside this Camaro, though, you, couldn't, you could hardly see anything. We had to stop and you actually had to, we had to come back to that spot later on. But at that moment, we couldn't really see anything because the windows, the visibility out of the Camaro is so bad that it was like, really hard to actually see anything. Um, and no, we didn't have an open top car, which was a, a great pity, but never mind. Um, so uh, after about an hour of driving in Yosemite Park, and we're in this sort of a bit of a daze, we eventually arrived at our campsite. So this campsite, it was called uh, the Housekeeping Camp. And uh, it's a really great place, really good location, and it's near the river, and there's a sandy area next to the river, which is a bit like a beach, and it's surrounded by pine trees, and you can see views of Yosemite Falls in the distance. It's great. It's very busy. There's loads of people there, and it can be a bit noisy, but there's a good atmosphere in this campsite. Um, to Let me describe the tents to you. Um, so they weren't like normal tents that are made of canvas or whatever. In fact, they were sort of partially solid constructions. So you had a concrete back wall, two concrete side walls, and a concrete floor. And then on top, a sort of canvas roof, and then canvas curtains um, for the other, the other wall, the fourth wall. Okay, so imagine concrete back, concrete sides, with, a can with canvas curtains to get in and out of the tent. Um, very, very, very simple very basic, a bit like an army camp or something like that. Okay, so that's where we stayed. Very basic stuff, just a simple bed um, and stuff like that. Okay, um, so um, yeah, nice place, friendly atmosphere. Our tent is situated pretty well. Um, one thing we noticed, um, one thing we noticed is that um, uh, there are lots of regulations about bears. OK, lots of regulations about bears because this is bear country, Yosemite National Park. The park is full of black bears um, and they're all around the park. OK, and uh, the thing is that the bears come out at night and they go on missions into the valley to get food. And obviously the valley, that's where all the people are. They're not grizzly bears. They're actually black bears. There, there are no grizzly bears in Yosemite National Park anymore. They used to be, but they're all killed, which is a, which is a bit sad. Because grizzly bears are much more dangerous than black bears. Grizzly bears are, tend to be more aggressive and more defensive and are much more problematic for people. There are grizzlies in um, Yellowstone National Park and other parts of the states, but not in Yosemite. So the only bears they have in Yosemite are black bears, which are not as big as grizzlies and admittedly less aggressive, but still they are bears. And, you know, they're big and strong and they've got big claws and, you know, they're potentially dangerous creatures. Certainly, you don't want to come face to face with a bear at close quarters, um, even if it's uh, a black bear. So, anyway, let me give you some information about black bears in Yosemite National Park. So, um, uh, so apparently, uh, they have over two times the smell of a bloodhound. So, you know the way... Uh, bloodhounds are these dogs that the police or detectives use as a way of um, searching for evidence and stuff and they've got a like, super s brilliant sense of smell well apparently black bears have double the smell the sense of smell of a bloodhound they're very intelligent and uh, they are more curious and more confident than dogs and they have huge claws and they have padded hairy feet which make them silent when they're walking so you mustn't keep any food or any scented products in your car or in your tent. And that's like a really strict rule in the whole park, including this camp. You're not allowed to have any food or anything that smells. So scented products, that includes things like soap, toothpaste, shampoo, anything that smells at all. All of those things have to be put inside um, a bear box. So everything has to be put in bear boxes, which are very sturdy, made of solid tough metal and they're bolted to the ground and they've got like these very strong secure um, latches on the front of them okay um, so um, yeah there you go so apparently even if you leave food out if you're cooking and you just leave food on the table in your in next to your tent while you're cooking and you turn your back if you're not right next to the food a bear might appear and take the food away from you because if you're not right next to it, then the bear basically decides that 
it's not your food anymore and, and it's their it's their food so you know they will come and take your food so it has to be kept in the in these metal boxes at all times a bit like the way that you would keep food in the fridge if you take you know um you know the milk out of the fridge you put the milk back in the fridge if you're not using it same kind of concept okay um apparently if you leave food out they can appear and start feeding apparently at night all the black bears in the valley head down um, into the valley under the cover of darkness, which is a little bit scary when you're sleeping in a tent in the valley and you realise that there are bears all around, you know. Um, now, naturally, it's pretty exciting to be sleeping in a basic hut with just a curtain separating us in a bed and the bears, which I imagine to be wandering around our tents all night. Now, in fact, I don't have to imagine what that's like because that night, the first night, a bear decided to have a go at the bear box just outside our tent. So I woke up in the middle of the night and I heard uh, a bear attempting to open the box before moving on to try another one and then another box. And later on, I heard two people outside my tent walking past talking about the bear that they'd just seen. So imagine that, right? Middle of the night, lying there in bed, um, after uh, reading all this information about bears and so on, and I suddenly heard this <coughs> sound, and it's like just a few feet away. And the only thing separating me from this noise is this canvas curtain. And um, yeah, it was a, it was definitely a bear. It was a black bear trying to get into the box just outside our tent. And I was lying there going, "Oh God, oh God, what's, what's going to happen?" Because I was thinking. What's going to happen is the bear is not going to be able to get into the box, but he's going. He's still so hungry that he's going to try and investigate. And both my wife and me were wearing around our wrists these mosquito repellent bracelets. These are bracelets that go around your wrist and they make a smell to get rid of the mosquitoes. And this was really smelly and I'd forgotten to take it off. Um, and then I, when, I, when I was lying there in bed and there was a bear just a few feet away outside the tent, I was thinking, oh God, oh God, I hope he doesn't come in to smell this. Because if you can imagine how smelly it was to him, um, you know, they've got double the sense of smell of a bloodhound. So it must have been really strong to him. Um, so I was convinced that the bear was going to try and come in the tent in order to try and have a look at, at what the smell was, at least. You know, they're pretty confident, these bears. They just, well, what's that smell? Let's go and have a look. So I was lying there thinking, any second now this bear is going to try and poke his head through the, through the curtains. So I was naturally a little bit nervous. Uh, nothing happened, thank goodness. The bear moved on and tried to get into another box. I heard him move around. I heard different boxes in the distance. I heard him scratching and clawing at them. So that was an interesting moment. <laughs> um, so... Uh, apparently, if you come across uh, a bear, a black bear, um, if you actually meet one, uh, what you're supposed to do is you're, you're supposed to shout at it angrily in order to try and scare it away. So you're supposed to shout at it. So what, what should you say to a bear? What, what should you shout at, at a bear if you meet one? What is the appropriate thing to say to a bear in order to scare it away? This is what I was wondering. So... Um, you know, I wouldn't want to be too rude, but at the same time, I think it would be necessary to talk to the bear in rather a strong way, you know, in rather strong terms. I don't, I suppose indirect language wouldn't work. Now, you know, I'm British, so it's natural for me to be slightly indirect and tentative in that kind of situation. It's not necessarily my first instinct to um, shout rude things at a bear, you know, I want to be more reasonable than that. So I was lying there thinking, what am I going to say if a bear does come up to me? Uh, I suppose you have to be direct and clear and yet reasonable with the bear. Um, I, I'm joking, of course. I think that probably if I did meet a bear, I would just scream at it and I would swear and I would say any old nonsense just to try and get, get rid of it. <laughs> um, but I imagine, I imagine some of you would be a little bit more cool about your bear encounter, but not me. I would freak out, I think, because um, I'm from the UK, you see, and, and the thing is that we killed all our bears 
in, in the UK. It's very sad, but we killed all our bears years ago. We made them fight with dogs and other cruel things. It was terrible. So I imagine that any bear meeting me as an Englishman and hearing my London accent wouldn't be that friendly, you know? So I don't think there would be any need to be cool. I, would, I think that freaking out and panicking and trying my best to scare the bear away is probably the order of the day. Um, so, um, yeah, imagine. What, what would that be like? Um, sorry to bother you, bear, but uh, I hope you wouldn't mind. I, again, I'd just like to apologise for all the things my ancestors did to you, but um, would you consider uh, running away? That's not going to work. <sighs> it's going to take your face off. You need, you need a, a more... Um, confident approach than that I think so um, the place the, the camp has a lovely summer camp hippie boy scout feel to it um, yeah I wanted to talk more about what you should say to a bear let's honest let's let's think about that a little bit so it would probably be something like uh, actually um, I heard someone tell me that that you should say hey bear hey bear like that with an American accent um, but as an English person, uh, yeah, I'd probably say, oh, I, don't know. I don't know what I would say. Um, anyway, um, so it's a lovely place, nice hippie feeling sort of to it, kind of chilled out vibe to it. It's a bit crowded, lots of kids. Um, it would be nice to have the place to ourselves, but of course that's impossible. Dinner at the Yosemite Lodge down the road, nice modest canteen food. Um, uh, we bought some tourist stuff like a cap and some playing cards and things and then we went to bed after making sure all the food and all the smelly stuff was in the reinforced box and then we drew the canvas curtains. Uh, the canvas curtains were definitely not reinforced and we, I tied them with a very good knot. I don't know if that was going to make a difference but I decided that we'd use like a really strong knot um, to make sure that the, the curtains of the tent would be secure. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I was thinking of course the bears won't be interested in us. Uh, but apparently they are very curious. So, yeah, I've already said this, but I'm just reading from my notes. We're wearing mosquito repellent coil things and they're quite interesting and smelly. Maybe a bear will find it interesting. Maybe a bear will come into the tent and say, oh, hello, what's that on your wrist? I don't know what the equivalent, the bear equivalent of what's that on your wrist would be. Maybe it would be like, let me poke my hair, my head at your tent and bite your arm off. That's how a bear speaks, by the way. Um, let me let me bite your arm off or just maul you a bit. Because that's what bears do, isn't it? That's what dangerous animals do. They maul you. Yeah, that's the word that we always use, to maul. If you ever read a, a story in the newspaper about, um, you know, um, a, someone who got attacked by an animal in the zoo or some kind of big cat attack, they always get mauled by the animal, to maul someone. Anyway, so... Maybe that's what it was. So anyway, we slept well in the open air, despite all of these thoughts about bears in in my mind. Um, we, we had I had to go to the loo in the night, which was quite a scary moment. So, you know, I, I needed the toilet. So um, I decided that I would go for it. So I kind of, you know, got out of the bed and and put my flip flops on and everything. And I s poked my head out of the out of the curtains um, and, you know, I thought, right, come on. Let's not muck around. So I went outside. Every every step, I was imagining a bear to just appear at any moment. I went into the little toilet cubicle and I had a look first to make sure there was no bear in there. You know, I thought that for some reason there would be bears in the toilet. I don't know what they would be doing, just sort of hanging out in the toilet, doing a poo or something. I don't know. Um, anyway, so I did my business. And of course, I had to look over the door uh, before leaving the cubicle just to make sure that there wasn't a huge bear waiting for me but everything was fine so it was all it was all okay in the end um what time are we on it's 48 minutes on the podcast and much longer on the periscope i think okay i'm going to pause the podcast for a second and talk to the periscope people um okay right i think what i'm going to do is because this podcast is going on and on and what i my plan is uh my plan is to eventually get this video and put it onto YouTube but if the video is too long it's going to take too long to upload it might not be possible to upload it so I think what I'll do is stop this broadcast I'm going to stop the periscope um, and maybe I'll start another one so I'll, I'll stop this periscope and I'll let my phone save the um, thing 
Can you tell us a few words about what was the end of your visit to the McKittrick Hotel? All right, all right. So I'm going to stop this periscope and let my phone deal with it because it's got to save the video onto my phone and then I'll do another one after that. So I'm going to, I'll be back in a minute. So just give me a second. I will be back in a second. Um, how do I stop this? I don't actually know. Um, all right, if you, if you don't, uh, oh, there we go. Stop broadcast. Okay, so I'll, I will be back. All right.